This presentation has been developed by North Parks Mine and Rio Tinto using the resources of the Minerals Industry Safety and Health Centre at the University of Queensland. The three modules cover the management of major hazards in the minerals industry, including human factors issues, the events related to the North Parks air blast, and finally, the lessons learned from the event. Module 2 of this three-module resource covers the story of the North Parks air blast event. As mentioned in Module 1, there are many major hazards inherent in the Australian mining environment. Some of these hazards involve energies that are required and therefore acquired to assist with the mining process. These energies include gravity, explosives, large machinery, high voltage electricity and many others. The natural energies of the industry, ground, gas, large bodies of water etc may be even more potentially destructive than the acquired energies. Also as previously discussed, these natural energies may involve higher degrees of uncertainty related to their existence, magnitude and or consequences should an unwanted release occur. Wind blast and air blast are two events that result from a loss of control of ground in an underground mining development. The magnitude of the hazard is generally dependent on the nature and status of the mining method. The term wind blast is usually used to refer to violently displaced air due to large collapses of gof in an underground long wall or pillar extraction coal mining operation. Air blast is usually used to refer to a similar event in various metalliferous mining techniques. Air blast is a major hazard in some metalliferous mining methods such as open stope and block caving. It should be noted that being a major hazard does not suggest that air blast is always an unacceptable risk. Air blasts occur because of large falls of ground that displace air underground swiftly and often through narrow pathways that compress and thereby increase the violence of the release. If effective controls are in place to address the air blast risk, then the situation is acceptable. Block caving is an underground metalliferous mining method that involves artificial development of an underground cave, where fall of ground from the roof of the cave is deliberately initiated in order to retrieve an ore body. Block caving has been used for diamond and other commodity mining in South Africa as well as the Americas. By design, block caving methods create an opening that potentially exposes the operation to an air blast hazard. This hazard must be effectively controlled in block caves by the creation of air blast barriers, such as the pile of rock between the open cave and the extraction points, known as the muck pile, or concrete barricades where any other openings may intersect the cave. There are both advantages and disadvantages involved in the block caving technique. The advantages include the opportunity to greatly decrease operating costs to retrieve the ore through the use of gravity rather than using explosives or mechanical methods. This advantage may be seen in the reduced dollars per tonne operating costs of the mine. Exposure of people to classic mining events such as being crushed by a fall of ground is also greatly reduced since the cave area is not accessed at any time. Among the disadvantages are the reliance on natural propagation rate for mine profitability. In other words, the ground in the cave must collapse into the retrieval areas at a rate that meets the economic requirements of the mine's operation. If the caving rate is below production requirements, the mine can only wait for gravity to have an effect. As such, the expression production equals propagation becomes a rule of thumb for the block caving method. The potential for an air blast hazard and the requirement to ensure controls of high integrity are always in place is also a disadvantage of the block caving method, clearly demonstrated by several events that have happened in block caving mines around the world. An air blast involves the rapid displacement of large quantities of air, often under pressure in a constrained underground environment. The potential energy of an air blast depends on the amount of air that is compressed and the rate of that compression. The bicycle pump, 
commonly used to inflate bicycle tyres, offers an opportunity to illustrate the air blast hazard. A bicycle pump uses a plunger or piston to compress the volume of air inside the tube of the pump. In an air blast, the piston is the ground above the air. If that ground falls in a manner similar to the push of the piston, then all the air below the ground is compressed and pushed in whatever direction provides an avenue of escape. The volume of air being compressed depends on the size of the cave, considering both its horizontal dimensions and vertical height. Air blasts have occurred in block caving operations, releasing enough energy to move heavy mining equipment and kill people in proximity to the air blast. North Parks Mines is a copper and gold mine located near Parks, New South Wales. At the time of their air blast, it was operated and majority owned by North Limited. The mine commenced operation in 1993, initially mining two open pit mines and eventually developing an underground operation. The ore body has relatively low grades of copper and gold, which made the successful selection and operation of the mining method critical to economic success. Several mining methods were considered at various stages of feasibility and early operation, with full block caving being the final selection. The development of underground decline started at North Parks with shaft sinking in December 1993. The development of one level was undertaken more recently. The one level development was required to provide positions for further exploration of the deposit and drilling positions prior to finalising the design of the extraction level. Production started as ore was extracted during development of undercuts. The first draw points were also constructed and some caving occurred naturally in these draw points. The mine design was completed in September 1996. Through most of 1997, the air gap was controlled by careful drawing down so that the gap remained in the range of 10 to 20 metres in height. The extraction level was always protected from falling rock by the muck pile. It appears that only limited caving occurred from the cave back or roof after undercut development was completed. Blasting of the undercuts continued into 1997 and all 130 draw points on the extraction level were completed by September. In September 1997, it was decided that the extraction level could be protected from air blast effects using controlled muck pile levels in the cave. Several levels were suggested with inherent safety factors. The mine selected a muck pile barrier of 60 metres from the various options specified. At this point, the 60 metre muck pile barrier replaced the 10 to 20 metre air gap guideline as the key control for air blast at the mine. Around this time, the underground team at North Parks conducted a qualitative risk assessment to identify major hazards. Air blast was considered, but the provision of a 60 metre muck pile to protect the extraction level from an air blast meant the subsequent risk ranking did not place air blast in a category that required further analysis and review. The air blast hazard energy involved in a groundfall of 10 to 20 metres was considered and probably correctly seen to have moderate potential consequences. Also at that point in time, there were no other unbarricaded openings into the cave. Generally, 1998 and early 1999 saw sporadic induced caving and some natural caving, but not to the desired levels of production. Several short blasting and hydro fracturing programs done from the surface, the extraction level and from one level were tried during that period. The air gap in the cave averaged approximately 50 metres. It also appears that the seismic monitoring system was considered to be ineffective for practical mining needs during that period. Shortly thereafter, the air gap had grown to about 110 metres and the cave reached one level. One level was the exploration drive that intersected to about the middle of the ore body. This meant that parts of the drive fell into the cave as the cave progressed upward which in turn provided the potential for an opening into the cave. Drilling and hydrofracturing recommenced in March 1999 and several discrete programs involving drilling from one level continued until the event in November. 
Qualitative risk analyses were completed on the drill and blast program and other activities that were being put in place on one level to induce caving. The analyses recognised an inrush hazard related to the eventual subsidence, resulting in the introduction of a concrete bulkhead installed in one level. It also led to the installation of an extensometer alarm system to warn drillers working in the area of changing ground conditions. These were seen as effective risk controls so that further detailed risk analyses were not carried out on the potential for an air blast. A standard operating procedure, or SOP, was also implemented for responding to alarms from the system. As November the 24th approached, the air gap progressed to over 150 metres due to the production rate exceeding the caving rate. No significant caving occurred in the week up to November the 19th. However, on the evening of the 19th of November, intermittent major caving started occurring from the cave back. This was believed to be the result of hydrofracturing that had occurred during the week. A major caving on the evening of November the 19th caused vibration and ground movement on one level, as well as some dust, wind and pressure on the extraction level. It was estimated that 500,000 tonnes of rock caved from the 19th to the 22nd of November. During this period, on one level, it was noted that some of the centre drive beyond the bulkhead had fallen into the cave. There was intermittent major caving throughout Tuesday the 23rd of November. Measurements taken on the 23rd indicated the muck pile increased in height by 4 metres. The cave back was now approximately 180 metres above the muck pile and 50 metres above one level at the centre point. The muck pile over the extraction points was over the defined protection level of 60 metres. At this point, it's important to note that there are two distinct zones of rock mass at North Parks. The deeper zone is characterised by gypsum veining and relatively higher rock mass quality. Closer to the surface is the gypsum leached zone. In this zone, the gypsum in the ore body has been leached out by groundwater, leaving a weaker rock mass. As the cave propagated upwards, the change in rock mass conditions, the effect of surface proximity on in situ stresses, and the changing cave back profile induced by the hydro fracturing and blasting programs combined to increase the potential for a rapid caving event. On the 24th of November, the mine was not producing. It was a designated maintenance day, requiring more people underground than normal. At the time of the event, there were 61 people underground, compared to a normal production shift of approximately 25 people. Frequent major caving was occurring. There was significant noise and vibration on the extraction level and one level. Based on a later seismic report, rapid continuous caving commenced at 2.46pm. The caving broke through into cuddies off a south drive off one level as well as a collapse of the centre one level drive area under the bulkhead. Within seconds, the plug of collapsing rock over 100 metres thick compressed an estimated 4 million cubic metres of air in the cave. The rapidly and highly compressed air then began to escape from the cave by several routes. Some of the pressurised air vented up through the collapsed materials to the surface. A large dust cloud rose from the open cut area. Some of the pressurised air vented down through the muck pile and into the extraction level. This occurred even though the muck pile cover over the extraction level at the time was over 80 metres thick. The effects of the venting varied across the level, but generally there was minor trickling from draw points, hot air, dusting, shrieking noise and some air movement. Individuals in some parts of the level experienced ground movement, rock noise, cracking noises, ear popping, no or reduced visibility and difficulty standing. The final path for the escaping pressurised air was through one level. The air with entrained rock, debris and other material entered one level with extreme velocity, mainly through the south drive and partly via the centre drive. Subsequent modelling estimated that the air velocity was over 300 metres per second, or over 1,000 kilometres per hour, 
pressurized up to 15 atmospheres, or over 1,500 kilopascals. Once in one level, the air pressure, now an air blast, proceeded toward the decline. The energy of the air blast bent roof bolts and plates, tore mesh from the drive walls and stripped the services from the drive. A 5.2 ton hydrofracturing pump mounted on a steel frame without wheels was located in the one level drive opposite a cuddy not far from the South Drive intersection. The pump was blown about 170 metres down one level drive and in the process stripped of all components except the engine block, manifolds and the frame. Somewhere in one level or at the intersection of one level and the decline, the air blast struck the utility used by the two drillers that had been working in the south drive of one level. The ute disintegrated, sending parts up and down the decline. Parts landed some distance up the decline. Some parts of the utility that went down the decline were later found in the shaft access decline and on the surface near the winder of the hoisting shaft. Sadly, the drillers, Mr. Stuart Osman and Mr. Colin Lloyd-Jones were hit by the air blast and fatally injured. The air blast propagated in two directions from the one level decline intersection, up toward the surface and down toward the extraction level. The air blast travelling up the decline blew out the ventilation barricade between the decline and the ventilation shaft. It flowed into the ventilation shaft and then to the surface. The energy from the air blast blew out the blast doors on the main fan and blew a one ton piece of equipment 170 metres vertically into the main fans. Some of the energy of the air blast continued up the decline to the portal. There was some damage to the portal set lagging boards similar to sandblasting and some damage to the road surface. Materials were also propelled out of the portal. The portal damage and other information from observers indicate that the energy released probably continued for several minutes. Unfortunately, the air blast that travelled down the decline toward the extraction level from one level encountered another vehicle. This vehicle was a land cruiser with two passengers. The manager of mining, Mr Ross Bodkin, and technical services team leader, Mr Michael House. The vehicle was picked up by the air blast and thrown around the drive. Both passengers were fatally injured. Continuing down the decline, the air blast engulfed a third vehicle. The driver saw the dust cloud approach and the impact of materials on his windscreen. He ducked below the dashboard for protection as the air blast smashed some of the utility windows and turned the ute. Shortly after the impact, he sat up in the vehicle and attempted to reposition it. At that point, another air blast hit the vehicle from the opposite direction, up from the extraction level. This air blast broke the rest of the utility's windows. The air blast also moved up the shaft access decline to the hoisting shaft. The energy moved hoisting skips, damaged guide ropes and head ropes, as well as blew the shaft collar doors open. The doors had been closed and sandbagged for the maintenance day. Debris was seen blowing out of the hoisting shaft for several minutes. Once the gusts of wind and materials from the two shafts and the decline died down, the event was over. Module 3 will discuss the lessons learned from this tragic event. We would like to thank Rio Tinto and North Parks Mine for their commitment to this presentation. This presentation is dedicated to the victims of the North Parks air blast. The drillers, Mr. Stuart Osman and Mr. Colin Lloyd-Jones. The manager of mining, Mr. Ross Bodkin. And the technical services team leader, Mr. Michael House.